Hi. Hi. We're here at the Plastic Surgery Meeting 2017 in Orlando. And I'm Dr. Michael Eisman, and this is Dr. Larry Weinstein. Uh, Dr. Michael Eisman is in practice in Houston, Texas. I'm in practice in Chester, New Jersey. And we're happy to be here at the meeting. We're being educated and sharing uh, experiences with other plastic surgeons and also learning about new technologies and things. But one of the things that uh, Dr. Eisman is especially known for is his approach to brow lifts. Michael, can you tell me anything about when you do a brow lift and what the technique that you prefer? Well, you know, I've had a number of techniques that I've tried over the years. Um, including endoscopy. Uh, typically, though, I do not use endoscopic instruments anymore. Um, basically, one of the problems with it was it shifted a hairline and also there was some hair loss with this, which made patients very upset. So we're basically doing a hairline brow lift, which is incision just four centimeters, right, in the temple area, four centimeters on either side. And we usually combine it with an upper lid blepharoplasty because typically the patients that we're operating on are elderly patients. So it's unusual that we wouldn't have concomitant upper lid blepharoplasty at the same what, time. What percentage of patients that you see have a receding hairline in the female population? I consider everybody have a receding hairline to some degree. That's um, and even, and even, even women who don't necessarily have a receding hairline have sparse hair and the hair quality is different. So they're very concerned about scars and also hair loss. So is there a special technique that you utilize in order to uh, have the hair grow back into the wound, like beveling? Well, we do. We bevel, we bevel the incision. We made it along the a trichophytic incision, which basically is an incision which uh, recognizes the direction of hair follicles. Absolutely. So, so that well, the, the hair will grow through the, through the scar. And uh, we close it in, in multiple layers, and it's a short scar. So but eventually, we, that usually ends up being virtually invisible. Yeah. The same thing that we do in the anterior yeah, portion the, of the face. Yeah, but the advantage facelift. of it is it doesn't disturb the deep branch of the supraorbital nerve. Mo most other techniques in the forehead disturb the, the deep branch of the supraorbital nerve, and of course, they can have numbness and dysesthesia and tingling, sometimes burning. So it avoids that nerve completely because it's a two-plane approach. It involves the subcutaneous plane and a subperiosteal plane. So it's very effective in releasing zones of adhesion along the, the eyebrow without using an endoscopic approach. And at the same time, we're doing a blepharoplasty usually with it. Because many people, they look like they have extra eyelid skin, but at least sometimes more than 50% of that is due to eyebrow skin. Do you ever use a, a tiny plate or a small screw this, to this help will hold not, it up? This will not require a, a plate or a screw because you're, you, you're removing non-hair-bearing scalp in addition to it. So, so in other words, you do a um, subcutaneous, subcutaneous and, and, and a subperiosteal, both. And in between okay, so that, this is like a dual plane a, brow lift. So in other plane. words, you're doing dual plane, you're bringing the entire brow up and also taking the skin and bringing it up as well. And this is ingenious. And the, Dr. And, Eisman's a genius. And between, and between those two layers yeah. is the, the frontalis muscle, yeah. which incorporates the deep branch of the superorbital nerve, which is it's fantastic. So you don't cut any muscle. You're going directly through the muscle fibers and lifting up the nerve and the muscle itself. And it's a fantastic way. And as I say, I bought twenty or thirty thousand dollars of endoscopic equipment, which is now a doorstop. Yeah. No, I recognize what he's been doing and I've utilized techniques similar to his. I prefer the uh, anterior incision in order to bring the hairline forward a little bit, bring the brow up a drop, and uh, I ha I do Sometimes due to dual plane, depending upon the nature of the skin and the texture of the skin, I don't think everybody needs it, but I think that uh, Michael is onto something and there are a certain number of patients where this technique is probably the best technique possible. Michael, uh, can you ask me anything about facelifts? Uh, well, actually, uh, I can talk about my mid-facelift, which is an article which I published in the Journal of Craniofacial Surgery which is a technique which involves no visible incisions. It involves an incision in underneath the eyelid in the conjunctival fornix and also inside the mouth. So we raise up the, uh, the uh, buccal fat pad and the periosteum and lift it up and fix it to the rim of the orbit so there's a direct vertical lift of the, of the mid-face. Yeah, I think one of the techniques that I utilize for the mid-face is a smash technique. 
where I actually take this submuscular apneurotic system and I suture it up so that the nasal labial fold is fixated above. I sometimes resect a little bit of this mass also, depending upon how it feels after I've lifted it. But you're it. doing it through an incision, a pericular I, incision. I've done it both ways, Michael. I know that the mid-facelift is very popular among certain populations. Also, if you have a very bad amount of skin on the lower lid and you want to resect that skin, it's probably the best approach is the mid-face. And I recognize your article. I enjoyed it. And I think it's definitely applica applicable in many patients. In certain patients, of course. Yeah, we, you know, that's part of this. The part of plastic surgery is selecting the appropriate operation for the perfect patient and not everybody needs that but when they do need it and they're appropriate it's a fantastic method for correcting a tear trough deformity of the lower lid it's very good for people with eyelid malposition it's good for people who uh, would, could use a, a cheek implant for example sure so it's sure. a it's very versatile for the right person, and, and the younger patient, too. Now, one of the things I found, I'm using much less uh, cheek implants since we have uh, better fillers. One of the fillers I use for cheek augmentation is Voluma, which lasts a year or two, which also has a higher viscosity to help lift the area a bit. Yeah, that's a, it's a great way, and that is injected deeply. And uh, But again, of course, it's expensive, and it has to be repeated. So those yeah. are the, the disadvantages of it, but many people don't mind that, and um, that's a great way. In fact, just to see what the result would be if you decided to put it something more permanently, like an implant, or sure. doing a more evasive procedure, which is an osteotomy, which is a permanent solution to the problem, with right. mainly for people who have congenital anomalies or developmental problems or from trauma. I'll tell you, one of the things I find in my practice, I've been doing a lot of uh, facelifts because uh, people are coming complaining about jowls, and excess skin of the neck. And the only way I find I can fix that is actually doing a facelift with SMAS, or a Z-lift is what I call it, where I make a Z incision around and back. And I think that works pretty well. I think uh, you haven't been an advocate of the SMAS as well. Yeah, we do, a, we do a deep, basically it's called a deep facelift, a two-layered facelift, and it's basically uh, the SMAS layer and the skin, and uh, mm -hmm. mul multiple vectors of, of advancement are useful and I think there's more permanency with that procedure than with the other techniques. Now I find you mentioned vectors and I find it's very important to identify the vectors that are going to help the patient best. Sometimes you have to do a virtually straight uh, in, in vertical inferior vector. superior lift and sometimes yeah. you have to do an oblique lift sure. depending upon the patient. I find for jowls the oblique lift is sometimes better but sometimes you have to do a, a vertical lift. Again it's the Patient selection is the key thing, and there's so many different techniques uh, that are applicable for different patients. How often do you make an incision under the chin? Uh, I first of all, I decide list. whether the fat pad is deep in that area or superficial. If you ask the patient to swallow and you can feel underneath their chin, that's usually deep fat pad, and I, there's only way to get that would be directly making an incision in the cemental crease. Superficial fat, you don't necessarily have to. You can do that with liposuction, but a deep fat pad, uh, underneath the uh, myelohyde muscle and the uh, uh, anterior belly of the digastric muscle, you'd have to do that. Yeah, I tell you, when I first started, I would always make that incision and tight, bring the anterior discipline muscles together. Uh, but I find that today, and uh, after watching other plastic surgeons work and seeing results, is I do my posterior incision first, lift the platysma, and uh, put the platysma in the position I want it to be in, as part of the mass elevation, and then trim the, trim the skin to get the exact amount of skin I want to elevate. And I find that very often I don't have a problem in the center of the face after I've lifted both sides. The other th aspect that I found extremely important is to bend the neck a little bit down while I'm doing the surgery, as opposed to extending the neck, because when the neck is extended, you don't see as much skin. But when you bend the chin down a little bit on my operating table, I make sure I get all of that extra skin. Do you find a similar process? Sure. The positioning is important. For example, we don't use a shoulder roll for that exact reason because when you use a shoulder roll, the neck is automatically extended and you end up taking out less tissue than you would normally do and, and, or need to. Uh, but uh, This is why you should go to a master surgeon, an experienced surgeon, when you consider a facelift the, uh, or brow lift. Because it's not just fat, it's an anterior platysma banding that you're basically in. And if I do have anterior platysma banding, I usually will do a, a direct approach and do what you did, is basically sew up the anterior yeah. order of the platysma. I tell you, I disagree with you in terms of the deep fat, because it's very rare that I have the it deep fat rare. that has to be removed 
And sometimes if you take that deep fat, you get, end up getting an excavated appearance. Well, you were asking about whether you actually, what would be the indication for it? And of course, I don't usually, I don't often have to make that submental incision, but that would be one of the reasons I would if someone has a large amount of uh, submental fat. Yeah, a deep fat. You know, you wouldn't get an excavated appearance because you're very careful in terms of what you. Everything would is uh, moderation. Moderation. <laughs> the other thing is liposuction is really good to take out a little fat when you have a fatty neck, and then you can always inject it in little spots in the face. Are you an advocate of fat injections into the face? I do. I use it all the time. In fact, I, it's my preferred method of uh, rather than uh, Voluma or the other methods. I do use fat because it's usually an adjunctive procedure, part of a facelift. Patient's already asleep. And sure. rather than discarding that material. But the point, when a patient comes into the office and wants a quick procedure as an office procedure and they're seen that same day, I would use Voluma or Radius or uh, Juvederm, any of the other so hyaluronic acid I materials. I think I agree, I agree with Michael because I like the predictability of the existing products that we can put in and it's going to last a certain amount of time with a certain result. With the fat injections, sometimes you can have a little bit more bruising and you're not exact in terms of the predictability of whether it's going to, how much of it's going to stay. And in fact, if it does stay and someone gains weight, it can actually increase in volume. There so have been some long-term studies basically about that, showing actually that the, the fat actually gravitates down and it's not where you wanted it originally. So there's advantages of each technique. Uh, exactly. Especially but, in a young patient. with a master experienced surgeon, the chance of you having a problem with it is much less. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Very good.